Hi, I'm Judith Stunnell from JBA Consulting. I'm a hydrologist. My main area of um, expertise is water resources and low flow hydrology. I've worked for JBA for 16-ish years and before that I worked for the Environment Agency in Northwest England. So today I'm going to talk to you about interpreting hydrological data. A few years ago a colleague of mine talked to a similar conference and he called it letting the data speak, which I think is quite a good way of looking at it. The other thing that I'm going to just talk about briefly is the idea of environmental flow so that you get a bit of an understanding about where these come from, how they're worked out and what you might need to do about them. So the first thing we want to remind ourselves is why does surface water matter to hydrogeologists? I'm sure you've all seen many variations of this uh, water balance type figure. So the basic reason is because the surface water and the groundwater are connected. It's easy to forget about that as we focus on our own area of interest, but groundwater is gaining water from the catchment via recharge and is also delivering it back into rivers via base flow. So this next slide, just again, it's a reminder surface water groundwater interactions so it may be because of some human influence so for example dewatering and groundwater pumping can affect river water levels and river flows uh, might be in the sh over the short term might be over the long term but you need to understand the impacts of, of what's happening and then you've also got the situation where actually you've got natural interactions between groundwater and surface water so this picture is an area of um, carboniferous limestone got cast features so the if you like the surface water is just disappearing into the cask, reappears later on as uh, springs. So if you're trying to understand the surface water in a water course like this, you really need to understand the groundwater and how it's influencing things. Another reason you might want to uh, be thinking about surface water and interactions is if you're setting up a groundwater model. So we've got the um, a diagram for a mod flow model and in this one the green areas is um, a surface water feature and you're interested in how is that interacting with groundwater. On the right you've got the conceptual model of the Sherwood sandstone um, showing you the interaction between the surface water and the groundwater in a more looking at the groundwater in a more uh, detailed kind of way because you're trying to build up a picture of how is the water moving through the different groundwater layers and then how how is it actually likely to interact with your surface water. Another point is about around understanding water quality. Uh, it's easy to point the finger at a particular source of water quality as a problem. But in fact, if you understand how the groundwater is contributing, then that might give you a good indication of um, what you could understand for water quality. Groundwater is often a, um, a different temperature and may have a different chemical signature. So it's a tool that you can use to understand uh, where the water is coming from in your catchment. The next group of slides uh, look at the question, why does river flow matter? So we'll be thinking about environmental flows, how to work them out and what you actually need to do with them. River flows support ecosystems. This uh, plot is taken from a UK government document and is quite a nice way of looking at this. So you've got your time of year across the bottom and your size of flow going up the side. You can see the blue blocks at the bottom are the minimum flow. So that's, if you like, the minimum that you need for your ecosystem to function. And it will adapt to whatever this looks, regime looks like in a particular water course. Um, but also the medium flows are important. We tend to think about droughts or floods, but actually the uh, medium level flows that you see in spring, autumn or you know, any time in the year really are important for uh, fish movement and movement of some of the smaller material along the channel. And then you get your big flood flows. And what they do is they move geomorphological material um, along the channel, maintaining its structure and its shape. The Water Framework Directive is obviously a huge to topic. And for this talk, we're, what we're interested in is the hydrological side of it. So the Water Framework Directive, as you probably know, considers the ecological health of the water environment. So we're looking at biology, ecology, chemistry, hydrology and morphology. 
and from the hydrology point of view uses the idea of environmental flows. So these are the flows that are required in the river to support the ecology at good or high status. So what the Water Framework Directives are aiming to do is for river reaches to meet good ecological status. Now, this isn't always practical. So you also have the idea of a heavily modified water body. So this is one where there's an overriding reason why it's not going to meet its good ecological status. So in this case, you talk about good ecological potential. Uh, what do we mean by a heavily modified water body? Well, something that's used maybe for public water supply or hydropower. Um, so how do you decide what your environmental flow should look like in a catchment? Well, the UK Technical Advisory Group have uh, developed environmental flow standards, and these are used in Northern Ireland. So you look at what kind of a river is it? What sort of flow would you expect to see naturally? And what do you need to support the ecology in that kind of a water course? There's quite a lot of ongoing research in Ireland as well, as along with some changes to um, policy and the statutory requirements for water resources and for managing abstraction from rivers. So we've thrown a few words around there. So what do we mean by ecological status? There's five categories um, from high down to bad. The For the good and high status um, river reaches, then the hydrology defines and supports the condition. And what the Water Framework Directive says is that no deterioration is allowed in these um, kinds of river reaches. So if the condition is moderate, poor or bad, then under the Water Framework Directive, an improvement is required. So the aim from a hydrological perspective is to restore flows to the level that is required to support a good ecology. And how do you define what that is? Well, this is where the idea of the environmental flow comes in. If the flow in the, in the river is above the environmental flow, then in terms of the hydrology, the conditions are um, good enough that the ecology should be able to be in high or good conditions. The first question we've got to um, find an answer to is what's the river condition? So these pictures, again, taken from a UK document, just as an, to give you an idea of the sort of thing you might be talking about, um, is the idea of the difference between high and bad status. Um, so for high status, you've got to have a pretty natural catchment for the hydrology, and that includes the connection to groundwater. So if you had, for example, a borehole abstraction that was in fact having an impact on flows, even though it's not very visible, that would probably um, not be a high status, it would be a good status. So then as you go down through the categories, um, we've got here an example of a poor quality catchment. And in fact, this is, pro this is in terms of erosion, sedimentation and potentially the sort of water quality problems that you might get. get. So you can have um, catchment that's in poor status and actually it's not really related to the um, the hydrology. And then this the bottom picture is bad ecological status. So what you've got here is a very unnatural channel, uh, none of the uh, natural geomorphological features. Flow might be quite natural, but in terms of what can happen to um, for the ecology, then the situation isn't looking very good. Environmental or sometimes called e-flows are defined in you know, a number of different ways, but this uh, 2012 definition covers all the key points. Uh, and the diagram on the right is taken from a 2017 um, piece of research done in Ireland, looking at how to how to set um, environmental flows. You know, what's what's practical. Um, and I think this is a nice illustration of the complexities. So you've got lots of different pressures, things like climate change. Um, then you've got your basic water framework directive requirement. You've got sort of socio-economic drivers, then different stakeholders, different perspectives, um, data quality and availability. That's very important. Um, and I'm sure that you've all got experience of working on a project where, you know, any one of these things can actually cause quite a lot of complication. So the, the components that the, this research identified is the flow regime, so size, um, timing, the things that we looked at on that first slide in this section, the different pressures you might have, the ecology, um, and then 
the last one is around sort of flow paths and connectivity so this brings it back to the to the connections with groundwater although we're looking at surface water here it's always important to remember how it's how it's interacting with the groundwater returning to some real flow data this is a cumulative flow analysis and this kind of approach is quite a good way of looking at changes in a catchment so you work out the cumulative flow by taking flow on day one adding day two add, adding day three and over a long period of time you'd expect it to um, increase in a fairly linear fashion if there are no changes in the catchment and so in this example you can see that the flow accumulates um, along the top red line yes there's a bit of variation seasonally you know high flows in the winter low in the summer um, until you get to September 1995 and then the gradient of the line really flattens off um, and after about six months it recovers and re returns to the um, same sort of amount of accumulation that you saw before and so what you, what happened here is that the upper part of this catchment is underlain by a Sherwood sandstone aquifer so once the aquifer levels really started to drop then the um, you're getting much less runoff because any rainfall was um, being used for aquifer recharge and the um, aquifer was no longer generating the um, amount of base flow to the river that you would see in normal um, conditions Another idea that gets thrown around um, by hydrologists when they're talking about this kind of uh, environmental flow assessment is the idea of natural versus observed flow. So in many catchments, what you actually see in the river is not the natural situation. And when you're looking at the ecology and the environmental flow, you do need to consider what would this look like under natural conditions. Uh, so there's a number of different things that might be uh, contributing to this so there's abstractions water that's being taken out of the river uh, question you know what's what's it for how much water is taken how much is used when is it used does any of it get back into the river is any of it measured and then you have got discharges so that's um, water that is coming into the river it might be coming from say a sewage treatment works or an industrial premises Sometimes it can be linked to an abstraction. So, for example, if you get a factory that abstracting water, using some of it and then putting back the rest as wastewater. You've also got reservoirs. So in that case, you are trapping flow uh, in drier periods when the reservoir levels are low, you're probably making some sort of a steady release, maybe some seasonal releases. Um, and then you've also got your groundwater impact. So this has got it as a something coming out of the river, but as we've already discussed, could be um, groundwater contributing to river flow as well. Uh, and that all of this uh, adds up to give you your observed flow. And so understanding how these things are interacting is one of the things that you need to know about if you're trying to work out what should my uh, environmental flow look like in this particular catchment. This hydrograph compares the um, flow in for the same period of time for a river in the south of England and one in Ireland. The red line is the one in the south of England. This is a chalk catchment, so the flow is supported very significantly by uh, groundwater base flows. The blue line is the uh, Irish catchment what you can see there is that it is what hydrologists describe as flashy so that means that when it rains it responds really quickly you get a sudden big peak and then it recovers quite quickly down to its um, base flow levels and when you look at something like this you can see very clearly that for environmental flows one size doesn't fit all because what's an appropriate uh, target flow in the groundwater supported catchment is not going to be the same as one in the uh, flashier um, catchment. The next couple of slides are taken from the Northern Ireland legislation adopting the uh, Water Framework Directive into law and it's an example of the a typical sort of way of deciding what your environmental flow should look like. So you can go out look at the river decide which category it's currently in you may then know that it needs to be improved or that you need to make sure that the flow is maintaining it but you but that doesn't really tell you what should that environmental flow look like so these 
these lookup methods are the way that, that this is usually assessed. So in this first table, this is for working out what kind of a river it is. Um, so the first column is different sort of classes of river A1 down to D2. And then depending on their rainfall, the base flow index, we'll talk about this a bit later, but essentially it's the um, proportion of the flow that is uh, supported by groundwater or some other catchment storage. And then the catchment area. So if you've got um, a very big catchment, there may be enough going on that it's less sensitive um, to some of the changes that you might uh, see. And then once you've decided what kind of river it is, then that will determine how much water should there be for your environmental flow. So depending on the um, whether you're looking at high standards, good standards, then you might have a different uh, amount of flow that's required. So these two tables, one is for the high environmental standards. So in this case, whatever kind of catchment you've got, you're allowed to take 10% at higher flows and 5% at lower flows. For the good environmental standards, varies a bit more between the different catchment types. Um, so, in fact, as you go down the table, you're getting up into the headwaters. And what, in fact, you can see is that you're actually allowed to take less because as you get into these smaller catchments, then they're likely to be more sensitive to change. Flow duration curve is a really useful tool for a hydrologist, particularly when you're looking at these environmental flows. So the previous slides have used high, medium, low flows without really decide, describing what, what do you mean by this. So flow duration curve looks at the whole flow data set and looks at what's the percentage of time that any flow is equal or exceeded. So if you look at this plot, then along the bottom, mm -hmm. the 10% flow um, it's fairly, actually fairly high flow. It's only exceeded 10% of the time. And then as you get down to, say, uh, Q90, so that is a flow that is exceeded 90% of the time, it's a pretty low flow uh, in a catchment. And so across the flow duration curve, you can define what you mean by your different flow ranges. So in those previous tables, uh, if you look at the small prints, they'll say if flow is between zero and Q30 or Q30 and Q70. And that's how they'll define the, the range at which those um, particular amounts of uh, abstraction are uh, permitted. The shape of the flow duration curve can tell you about what kind of a catchment you've got. So in particular, the slope. So if you notice, this one's plotted on a log scale and, and that's because it um, flow duration curve can kind of disguise what's happening at the low flow end of the plot um, because the high flows are so much higher than the low flows. So in this case, you've got two examples. The pink line is an impermeable low storage catchment. So going back a couple of slides, that's the blue flashy um, hydrograph. So the high flows are high, but it drops quite quickly down to the low flows. And then the blue line shows um, a permeable high storage catch or high storage catchment. So this is one where there is uh, some sort of storage in the catchment that means that your high flows are attenuated. So that means they're reduced, um, spread out over time. And the low flows are also um, supported in some way. So, so the shape of the curve is much flatter than in the impermeable catchment. Hopefully now we've got an overview of environmental flows, what they are, why you might want to use them. A lot of this comes down to the idea of how sensitive is your uh, river and how significant is the action that you're thinking about taking. And how are we going to understand that? The answer is we're going to look at the data and see what that tells us. So the first thing that hydrological data might be telling you is how things vary in space. So this is the situation where you've got two uh, watercourses crossing the same aquifer. But you can actually see from this that they're not going to behave in the same way. One of them uh, intersects with the water table. So there will be the river will be gaining water from groundwater. And on the other one, it's sitting above the um, water table. So uh, water is going to flow out of the river into the groundwater. I will just say the terms that influence and effluent, you need to think pretty carefully about what you're using them because whether water's flowing in or out depends on your perspective. 
This is uh, an illustration of some peaks over the threshold, looking at a particular watercourse in Australia, two different gauges. And the question is, can you use one to understand what's happening at the other? And in this case, it uses peaks over threshold data. So that takes uh, some sort of a definition of a high flow, looks at uh, events that are higher than that, and then uses those in the analysis. So for each of these events, you plot them up, you've got a pretty good correlation. So I think when you look at something like that, you can look at one site and decide what is likely to be happening at the other site. Obviously, there is some scatter, so it's not a perfect answer. But compared to having no answer at all, it's you know quite good information. The other thing that your data might tell you is how things vary with season. Why is that important? Well, to think back to the environmental flows, what's happening in the summer compared to what's happening in the winter. If there's more water available in the winter, you might be allowed to do something different. So this plot is, has the months of the year around the outside and the distance from the centre is uh, represents the magnitude. So this is maximum lake levels in Windermere in Cumbria. So what you can see here is pretty much every year the annual maximum lake level occurs in the winter between October and April. There's not any particular magnitude seems similar right through that period. But then there's a very notable exception in 1938 where you've got the highest annual maximum level is in the summer. Um, and this just reminds us that just because it's more likely that something will happen at a certain time of year doesn't mean it would never happen any other time. The other thing our data might tell us is how things vary over a long time scale. So this is the outflow from Windermere, um, again, looking at the annual maximum. And we've put a 10 year moving median through this. So you can see if you look at the uh, orange line and the trend line, they're both increasing from 1935 through to uh, 2005, the end of this particular analysis. And this is uh, an example of a trend in data that you would want to know about if you're looking at what's appropriate now, maybe using the earlier bit of the record is not, rep not representative of what you're seeing now. I think on something like this, where the, there's those two very large events right at the end of the record, you'd perhaps need to just do some extra testing to make sure that those two events weren't skewing the whole the whole thing and the rest of it is flat. And in fact, what you're looking at is a step change at the end. The other thing you might be looking at is impacts of human influences. So this is a, um, again, it's annual maximum flow from a gauge in Ireland. And what you can see here, there's a gap of date in the data in 1985 and what you can see here is before that the annual maximum flow is lower than the period after that and what happened here is there was a big um, arterial drainage scheme was put in that's designed to get water out of the uh, catchment quickly so following that the the annual maximum flows are bigger but in fact, over time, the channel has, in fact, um, adjusted itself back to, uh, if you like, more natural uh, drainage situation. But this is an example where you need to be really careful because all the, the different sections of that record are not necessarily representative of what you, what you want to test uh, in terms of the current situation. Other things you can get from your data set, how low is the flow likely to get? This is a river in Australia where actually the answer is zero, much less likely to see that um, here. But in a chalk catchment, you do get seasonal um, seasonal watercourses. And then also, obviously, how high is the flow likely to get? So this is a picture of a river in the uh, north of England in a, during a flood event. Um, and this will be picked up in the data that you've got available. We'll have a look now at some tools and techniques that uh, you might find useful to know about. Even if you're not doing them yourselves, you understand what other people are doing when they talk to you about their work. Um, so the first thing is looking at the data. The most important um, tool and technique is using your own brain. So there's some examples on this. 
uh, slide in the middle there's a plot we've already seen if you plot up hydrographs you can see is it a flashy catchment what does the groundwater um, base flow contribution look like on the left hand side we've got at the top a couple of hydrographs they look very similar but actually if you look at them one of them is over a period of, of days because you're looking at local catchment storage and another one is over uh, an annual period because you're looking at seasonal storage so just things to be careful about there at the bottom we've got a uh, plot of some uh, levels in Loch Earn. if you just looked at the data you'd wonder why is it uh, higher in the summer and the answer is because there's some sort of a control rule so this is the case where it's not just the natural processes that are going on but there's some sort of management that's affecting your uh, information and then on the right hand side just to remind you you can use hydrological information on a spatial uh, kind of way to look at how things are varying over an area so on the top you've got a plot which is looking at how the influence of lakes uh, is affecting flow in rivers and then at the bottom this is from a study in Canada looking at uh, flood forecasting and you can see by the coloured bands that as you go from west to east across the country the effectiveness of the methods is varying and that's because it in the coastal coastal areas you get particular weather patterns in the centre and the plains you get different sort of weather different sort of performance of your um, models so this is a picture of a couple of different catchments so the one on the left is in Hampshire in the south of England the one on the right um, is a much more wild upland kind of situation and if you plot up the hydrographs um, in some ways they're quite similar but actually what they're similar is that they're responding to uh, annual uh, vari variation and actually the variation is probably more to do with uh, seasonal temperature than rainfall because actually you know rains throughout the year often but what does change is the um, temperature and the amount of evaporation and water demand for um, plant growth and things so this slide just uh, talks about the water balance so this is a really fundamental idea for hydrology so basically in the long term all inputs within the boundary are equal to all of the outputs from the boundary so that's a close uh, catchment so the pre precipitation p is equal to the flow and the evapotranspiration so that's your losses through evaporation and um, vegetation uptake in the short term there might be some storage in the catchment so the you've got a bit of bit of missing water so precipitation is flow q and the evapotranspiration um, but actually there's a bit of water that's held in storage and you can move that equation around how you like to um, calculate different components of of the situation so another technique that might be useful for you is hydrograph separation so the idea here is that the hydrograph is a mixture of the water that's come into the system from base flow mainly groundwater um, and the surface water runoff so that's the if you like the if you like the slower and quicker parts of the um, flow regime so there's different ways you can do it you can just uh, sort of a guess you know how do you think it would have what do you think would have happened if it hadn't um, been raining and then there's sort of more simple things you can look at a constant base flow just assume that you've got a constant contribution or some sort of analysis of the um, recession so that's how your hydrograph is dropping down um, following a flow peak so this slide is a um, method from the Institute of Hydrology in the UK and it's just an example of one method there's quite a lot of literature out there if, if you're interested in uh, looking at this in a bit more detail so what you do is you split it into five day periods in each period you look at the minimum flow and then you compare this to the minimum flow in the period before and the period after to decide whether it's a turning point so this is uh, um, the blue dots the ones that have been identified as turning points and so you join those up and that gets you um, it separates out the base flow of, from your hydrograph um, and related to that is the idea of the base flow index so this is the um, proportion of the hydrograph that comes from base flow so in a very 
um, groundwater dominated catchment that will be a uh, high value it's between zero and one in theory and in a flashy catchment it'll be a very low value and this shows how it varies um, varies over island calculated from soils data uh, this is examples of flow accretion plots. So these plots, you look at the flow and how it changes as you go downstream. So zero is the upper end of your catchment that you're interested in. So as you go downstream, you'd expect it to increase. It might step up if you've got a tributary inflow. And if you've got a catchment where you've got a, a large base flow regime, then you can see it might actually decrease as you go downstream if you switch from the situation where uh, base flow is supporting the river into the situation where the river is losing water to uh, to base flow. Uh, another idea that you might uh, might be helpful is frequency analysis. So you might be interested in, you know, how often how, how often is the uh, river flow in a particular range? And this plot illustrates a uh, quite an important part of frequency analysis, which is particularly your highest flows are actually really unusual. So the whole thing is skewed. You know, on this example, most of them, most of the flows are between one and ten, um, but your high flows are very much bigger than that. And you, if you calculate the mean, you might actually find it's a bit skewed by the fact that you've got these small number of very high values. So frequency um, analysis, you quite often see this sort of plot, which is return period in years. So this is for minimum flow. And it's looking at a, um, use a, an output from an, an analysis of the data, which is looking at working out how often that you're likely to see flows of that um, kind of size. And then the final one in this um, meth this section is rainfall runoff modeling. Um, a rainfall runoff model is a model that you put in rainfall, you put in um, evapotranspiration, you calibrate your model so that it's representing observed flows over a period where you do have data and then you can run the model for a period where you do have rainfall data but you don't have flow data um, to use for, an, for um, some sort of analysis. I'm uh, involved in this kind of modelling at the moment for water quality assessments for catchments where there's only short temporary gauge records, but to do the water quality assessment, you need to be looking um, at frequency of meeting standards over a 10 year period. Uh, mean by that, so we're looking at things like uncertainty and quality, uh, and fundamentally, is it the right data to answer your question? So the first thing is, does data meet our needs? Now, this is an example from a study in Canada, which is looking at uh, flood peaks comparing mean daily flow data with instantaneous peak data and asking the question if you only had the mean daily flow data available would you get a good estimate of your flood peaks and on the y-axis you've got the ratio so if that's at one the answer is yes and if it's not at one then the answer is no not really and actually what this found is until you get to these huge catchments million square kilometers actually the mean daily flow is not telling you very well about the size of the um, peak floods. So in this case, it's not appropriate. Another question you might need to think about is what's the scale of your date of your study? So are you operating on a basin scale, several rivers, um, are you on a catchment scale, a network of rivers all coming to the same outlet, or you're on a field or plot scale? Because each of those will determine how what level of detail you're interested in in terms of your data and your interpretation and you will need to think carefully about that this slide shows river flow data for the river derwent in cumbria in northwest england for a major flood event the top line the red line is a gauging site called camerton and when you look at the data you can see that something quite strange is happening over the flood peak the when you look at the site in more detail, what actually happened during this event was that the gauging hut was flooded to about 60 centimetres. And in fact, it was so undermined by erosion that it had to be demolished after, event, after the event and the gauge has actually been moved to a different location. So in a, in a 
in this event, you can see that the data is clearly suspect. But even in an event where you think the gauge has been recording perfectly, for a, an event of this size in a catchment, you always need to ask the question, yes, you've got some data, but is it telling you accurately what happened uh, in that case? Thanks very much for listening. Uh, if you've got any questions, please ask.